werewolf sneaking around someone's home at night, a hybrid creature attacking hikers, and a demonic encounter with a church youth group, all in the Appalachian Mountains. Now, before we argue in the comments about whether it's Appalachian or Appalachian, just remember that those things that wish to chew your flesh likely don't care how you pronounce it. And if they do care, well, then that's hilarious, but also disturbing. Enjoy these allegedly true scary stories set in the Appalachian Mountains. If you have a scary story of your own and you want me to narrate it, share it with me at darkstories.org. I would love to read some European forest horror stories. Also, if you've got a scary work story that's not so much supernatural, send it to me at eeriecast.com slash submit, and I might narrate it on my new show, Tales from the Break Room, which you can listen to and rate on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, or just search for it on your favorite podcast app. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Werewolf or Dogman Encounter From Anonymous I won't state my name for confidential reasons, but I've lived in rural forests all my life. This story took place in two locations within five to ten miles of each other, and it happened to me and two other friends of mine. My friends live in one of the most rural areas surrounded by farmland, forest, and the Appalachian Mountains. We were doing things normal people do when they hang out, but as soon as the night fell, the mood changed drastically. I felt as if I was being watched, it was just the beginning of the night and we started to hear this knocking sound at the back of the house. My friend told me not to worry about it. So we tried to take our minds off of this, but the sound got louder. Three consistent knocks turned into bangs. My friend had soon fallen asleep, but I couldn't. All of a sudden, I found myself peering outside of a small window. This window was almost 10 feet off the ground from outside. My curiosity soon turned to horror as a massive animal turned the corner of the house. This animal had long ears, ragged hair, and some human-like features only visible by the dim night sky. The one feature that stood out to me was its eyes. These large glowing yellow eyes with hardly a pupil in sight gazed back at me. I was paralyzed with fear. With nothing to do, I tried to wake my friend, but to no avail. After what seemed like an eternity, I finally just walked away from the window, ignoring it and trying to sleep. The next morning, I told my friend what I'd seen. He didn't want to believe me, but eventually I convinced him I was telling the truth. Nothing else happened during my stay. The weekend went on normally, and I left, not telling anyone else, as I didn't want to be seen as a liar. This next encounter happened after my friends had moved houses, almost two years after the first encounter. I'd arrived at their house, my second visit there. My friend had recently told me he had seen something dark and big and beastly looking. We had planned to catch sight of this creature again, but we had no luck. One night, in the dead of night, we were outside, trying our luck again at finding it. It seemed a bit ironic that there was a full moon out, we then heard a howl that sounded like it was a wolf mixed with a man's scream. The look on my friend's face then was like no other. This friend was a skilled hunter, and the way he looked was as if he had never heard this before. My friends also lived beside a cattle field, so when the howl pierced the air, the cows started to go berserk. We joked about it and tried to play it off, but even so, we were scared. As we were heading back inside, those eyes appeared in the dark. The moon's light shined on its body. I could make out more of its features then from where we stood. It was hunched over, still seven feet tall in that position, with sharp, jagged teeth, those same pointy ears, and what appeared to be a canine-like head on a man's body. I urged my friend to get inside fast, but still haven't told him why I freaked out. I haven't told anyone about this encounter, but I think what I saw was something straight from a horror film. Bear Beast of the Appalachian Mountains From Doug This story takes place in southwest Pennsylvania, 
roughly 40 miles north of the West Virginia border. I'm an avid outdoorsman and love spending time in nature when I'm not working. But one recent terrifying camping trip changed the way I look at the world we live in and what hides in the shadows. This happened in mid-April of 2020. I was out of work due to the crisis going on and decided it was a good time to go camping since it was relatively nice out. So I phoned up two good friends of mine to go camping on some state land in the Appalachian Mountains for a weekend. We'll call them Ron and Jake. On that day, we drove out to the most remote area we could find in the mountains. We parked my SUV, unloaded our tents and other camping gear, and hiked a few miles deep into the uncharted Appalachian Mountain wilderness. In case you're wondering, all three of us were carrying firearms for protection. We soon found a small clearing in the dense forest, a perfect spot to set up camp. But we did all notice some large scratch marks on some of the trees about seven feet off the ground. Of course, we didn't think much of it, as it was about an hour before dark, and we needed to set up our tents, gather firewood, and get a fire going. After that, we sat around the campfire drinking a few beers, listening to music, and retelling some old stories. By around 11 p.m., we all decided to call it a night. When we turned off the music playing on my Bluetooth speaker, we realized the forest had gone completely silent. How long it had been like that, I don't know. All three of us knew this was very odd, but we tried not to focus on it too much. We just climbed into our tents and tried to get some sleep. I awoke some time later to an overwhelming feeling of dread. Something inside me was begging me to get out of there, to leave. And the forest was still silent. Until that silence was broken by Jake screaming not too far away, followed by some gunshots and a very deep, loud, guttural roar. This was like a grizzly bear roar, but far deeper, if you could imagine that. I bursted from my tent along with Ron, now completely sobered up. We had our guns ready. We'd been asleep long enough that the fire had died down quite a bit, but there was enough light there to light up the campsite. Suddenly, Jake came sprinting back into the campsite with his gun drawn, completely pale white and looking absolutely terrified. He yelled at Ron and I to just run, that it was coming. Ron and I were still trying to comprehend what was even happening, but what I saw next will haunt me till the day I die. There, walking up to the edge of the campsite on four legs, illuminated by the dwindling light of the campfire, was a giant, hulking beast. It looked like a grizzly bear on steroids. Dark brown fur, extremely muscular body, glowing red eyes, and the detail that showed us it really wasn't a normal bear, or a bear at all, were the large curled horns on top of its head. This bear-looking creature began to growl and bare its teeth at us. When it stood up on its back legs, it easily towered over us at nine feet tall or so. The intense standoff was then broken by rapid gunshots by Ron. This snapped Jake and I from our petrification. We joined Ron in the fight with our guns. I'm not sure how many times we hit the beast, but eventually it did let out an agonizing pain-filled roar and dropped onto its stomach. The thing was definitely not dead. It was alive and growling, but momentarily paralyzed. I guess we'd pummeled it hard enough with our bullets to buy time, which allowed Ron, Jake, and I to sprint like heck out of there in the direction we'd come from. After a few minutes of running, we could hear not far behind us huge crashing footsteps and thick branches breaking. How neither one of us guys didn't trip and fall while trying to navigate our way through the dark Appalachian mountain forest while sprinting and being chased by some giant bear beast, I don't know, but it's an absolute miracle. Eventually, we did make it back to my SUV, and thank God I had my keys in my pocket. All three of us, completely out of breath, scrambled inside as I started up the SUV, that beast right behind us. I threw it in drive and stepped on the gas, speeding us all out of there. A few miles down the road, I had to slow down and puke out the window, due to the fear, anxiety, and exhaustion. The car ride back home after that was completely silent. It wasn't until the next day all three of us spoke to each other about that terrifying event. 
Jake said he had woke up later that night with the urge to pee really bad. He had gotten out of his tent and walked away from the campsite when we were sleeping to relieve himself. He said he heard loud crashing footsteps coming towards him in the campsite, so he drew his gun and soon he was face to face with the bear beast. That's when Ron and I heard Jake screaming and firing his gun. And well, you already know the rest. We never went back to that spot to retrieve our belongings, and I'm sure what we did leave behind was torn to shreds anyway by that creature. Be aware if you're near or in the Appalachian Mountains. Stay alert at night. There are strange, terrifying things undiscovered to mankind that live within those mountains. Lavender Silence from Anonymous The following story is told without exaggeration or embellishment. These events happened exactly as I'm about to describe them here. I would swear to all of this on a Bible under oath in a court of law. None of the following is fictionalized, just facts. However, the names and location have been changed, although I can divulge the general area where this happened. Along the Appalachian Trail I think I'm finally writing this down as some sort of self-help therapy, because I believe I have some PTSD from it. It's always in the back of my mind, and even now I think of it at least once a day, every day. For background information, I don't think that all religious people are crazy. I was raised going to church every Sunday when I was a kid, and I met good, genuine people who were well-balanced and sane. They practiced what they preached, fed the hungry, clothed the poor, and tried to live what they believed. These kinds of people are not the sort I'll talk about in this story. For reasons I won't go into here because it would take too long to explain, my family switched churches when I was about 13 or 14 years old. This new church was of the same denomination, but was a little more charismatic for lack of a better term. Bear in mind that this was also during the mid-1980s, when the Satanic Panic era was in full swing. People began to see Satan in everything, from toys to logos to rock music. So yeah, I went through the whole burn all your rock albums and only listen to Christian rock phase. What a laugh. If only I'd known then what I know now about some of those bands. But that's a whole different story. The short version is, a lot of them were phonies. Now, I only mention the satanic panic thing because it seemed to give rise to an influx of strange people that would come into some of these newer churches and claim to have the gift of discernment. They would say things to you like, The Lord told me that this is wrong. Or, You need to get that out of your life. I had one woman tell me that I had sinful homosexual tendencies because I liked men with long hair. Does that make any sense to anybody out there? I'm a girl but because I liked long hair on men, I guess she thought I liked women instead of men? How does that make any logical sense? Anyway, you can see what I was dealing with. There were plenty of preachers on TV back then who claimed to have these gifts as well. I'm sure you've heard all about the TV preacher scandals and such from that time period, but there were also these off-kilter churchwomen who did things like this as well. I saw several in this church and tried to steer clear of them as best I could. These women never looked happy or joyful, like the Sunday school and Bible school teachers I remembered from childhood. Nope, no smiling faces to greet you at the door or patiently read from the children's Bible to all the kids gathered in a circle for story time. No, these women were only concerned with what was deemed satanic for that particular week. Woe unto you if you happen to be into whatever band or movie they were ranting about. They just looked angry or judgmental all the time, and made me anxious and uneasy. This church attracted some personality types I wish now I had never been exposed to. It was like a magnet for them. While the majority of the congregation was made up of what you could call normal sorts, there were several individuals who eventually made me afraid whenever I sat foot inside any church door from then on. In time, it went beyond anxiety to outright fear. To this day, I'm never at ease in any church setting. On the few occasions I do go, my anxiety is through the roof. I sit in the back in the last row. 
I don't like people behind me and I'm always close to an exit door. If the church is very large with a huge crowd, all that means to me is that there are just more whacked out people to look out for and avoid. I was a young 17 year old when this incident happened. I'd gotten used to some weirdos that had either stumbled into this church themselves, off the street, or had been invited by well-meaning people trying to save their souls. We had it all. Drug addicts, alcoholics, and several touchy-feely men. Probable predators who always wanted hugs from the young kids, and maybe boys too for all I know. The preacher was always telling us to hug the person next to you, usually at the opening of the service. Even after several complaints from teens and parents about inappropriate hugging going on, this was still practiced nearly every Sunday morning. To this day, I don't understand why it was allowed to continue. I began to develop an intense dislike of anyone other than my family members touching or hugging me, to the point that I didn't even like to shake hands with strangers. I quickly learned who to avoid at all costs. All of these creepy huggers were men, I don't think any of the creepy women were after a cheap thrill, but these strange women were disturbing enough in their own ways. They would give long-winded testimonies during service, taking up time that was supposed to be reserved for music or the preacher's sermon. As I mentioned before, for the first time in my life, I began to dread getting up on Sunday morning due to having to dodge the predator men and having to duck out the door before the service actually ended so as to avoid these crazy women. I never got much out of the service at all, trying to keep my eyes on, I'd say about nine individuals, but none of them were as off-putting as a woman named Vicky. From the first time I saw Vicky, even before she ever spoke to me, and before I ever stood close to her or anything like that, I knew something was wrong. Now that I'm older, I know what these instincts are, that I was detecting an energy around people that's actually a warning sign probably a buried survival instinct of some sort, long watered down in our now civilized human brains, similar to an animal's ability to sense these things. If only I'd paid attention to the faint alarm bells going off in my head back then. But I was young and not yet in tune with my ability to sense this stuff. And after all, it had been drilled into us since we were toddlers, to love and accept everyone no matter what. You know, we're all sinners and all that. What I couldn't figure out, and what still puzzles me now, is how quickly this chick moved in to the church, and within just a few weeks was singing solos in the choir, participating in the service, and even teaching Sunday school. Yes, I had the misfortune of being in one of her classes, but only one or two times. I seem to remember getting transferred to a different class, thank God. And of course, she made fast friends with the other spiritual women gladly joining in when they would discuss all the satanic panic stuff. I don't know who she had initially come visiting with, but they must have been influential in getting her ensconced in a hurry. She claimed to have had past trouble with anorexia and had been healed from it. She looked like a skeleton though, but I thought, okay, maybe she just hasn't gained all the weight back yet. As for her singing, it's not like she couldn't carry a tune, but she was singing solos nearly every Sunday, telling her anorexia story along with it, again and again. Instead of finding this testimony spiritually uplifting, I got the feeling that she was somehow trying to emulate singer Karen Carpenter's story, maybe living some twisted, vicarious version of her tragic life. It was just plain weird, and she didn't have Carpenter's voice, that was for sure. No mellow, low voice. This woman was a soprano, this will be an important fact to remember later in the story. Anyway, this gradual takeover of sorts continued for several months. One incident affected me personally, because even though I was careful to not have much contact with this woman, I could not avoid it entirely. I would also occasionally sing solos during service. I was so young and naive then. You know how it is. Everyone tells you you have a lovely voice. You should use it or God will take it away from you. And my parents were involved with church music all their lives, so everyone expected me to follow in their footsteps. I cringe now when I think of standing up there on the stage singing. So one Sunday morning, I finished my solo, and at the end of the service, here came Vicky walking to the front of the line of people who had gathered to say, your song was beautiful, or other general compliments. I saw her approaching, 
that I could do nothing but stand there and deal with it. I couldn't just run out. That would have looked weird in that crowd of people. She got up to me, hugged me, of course, and said something like, Nice song, but you and I should get together and talk about your diction. For those of you who don't know, diction is the same thing as enunciation, singing the lyrics clearly. My first thought was, Look, woman, I'm not getting together anywhere with you, chaperoned or not, to discuss anything. I was really put off after that, because for one thing, this woman didn't know me or anything about me, and for another, her statement wasn't a compliment at all, and she had said it not too quietly in this large group of people. I don't mind constructive criticism, but she could have said this in a different setting. But on the other hand, I didn't want to be in any sort of setting with her, I don't remember what I said after that, or if I said anything at all, probably just nodded and moved on. I also never sang in that church again after that. Then came the youth retreat, and as you may have already guessed, Vicky volunteered to come along as a youth counselor. I'll note here that I had some bad experiences on youth retreats in the past. On one youth retreat, one of the young men in our group broke his leg and had to be taken away in an ambulance, and on another trip, Several years before that, some guy in a non-church camping group down the way in the next cabin fell 80 feet to his death when he leaned over the edge of a cliff to throw up from being drunk. So it wasn't always fun and games and singing kumbaya around the campfire. If I'd had the wisdom and outright second sight that I have now, I never would have gone to this retreat. The problem is, when you're still under your parents' roof at 17, you had to abide by their rules. Being at church and church functions every time the door was open was one of the rules. This included just about all youth activities, which was supposed to be a substitute for any worldly functions, which might result in hanging with the wrong crowd. Looking back, I would have rather hung out with my pothead friends at high school than go on this trip. My non-churched friends were cool with me. They knew I didn't drink or smoke, and they couldn't have cared less. We bonded over art and music, most of which I had to listen to covertly, of course. And peer pressure was something we laughed at, as we watched it dramatized in health class films and after school TV specials. I was, in every sense of the word, scared straight. If someone offered me a drink or drugs, I did a very simple thing. I looked them straight in the eye and told them I was afraid. It worked every time. I wouldn't engage in any activity if there was the slightest possibility that I'd throw up because I hated being sick. Still do. That's all there was to it. That's what kept me on the straight and narrow, not any religious teaching. And my friends, who were some of the heaviest drug users in the school, totally got it. We got along just fine. Later in life, I'd be their designated driver several times. I am digressing here, but my point is this. Tell the truth. If I'd told my parents the truth, that I was afraid to go on any more church youth retreats, and that I thought I was pushing my luck regarding bad incidences that had happened on them, they might have balked me at first. But ultimately, I think they would have let me stay home. They might have seen that their child was truly afraid. Then again, maybe not. In the end, I didn't say anything. Even though I had a terrible sense of foreboding, I kept my mouth shut. But I didn't want to go. I had this intense, though vague, premonition that I could not shake off. It was late summer, August, and I only had a week or so before school started back up, and I wanted to just stay home and relax before starting my senior year. As the day to depart for the trip drew near, I resigned to make the best of it, taking my old Super 8mm movie camera. Video cameras had been around for a while by then, but I still liked the look of actual film, so I would save what little money I had to buy the increasingly expensive little three-minute rolls of film, if nothing else, it would be a distraction. I could film some nature trails and maybe some of the other teens. After all, a few of them were friends of mine. From here on out in this story, I can only remember pieces of what happened, and only a portion of it will be in chronological order. The things I do remember are vivid, but if I tried to fill in the gaps, it would turn into fiction in those parts, and I don't want to do that. I want to tell the absolute truth with no drama or exaggeration. I think because of the trauma I experienced, it's impossible for me to remember some things. It's taken me a long time to get to the point of writing this down at all, and the next paragraphs will be the hardest I've ever written. 
The anxiety and PTSD are just that bad. My hands are shaking slightly as I write this. For starters, I don't remember hearing or knowing that Vicky was in fact coming on the trip. She seemed to just show up later on the second evening. I don't even remember her being at the church when we left. I don't even remember whose car I rode in to get to the place. If we'd taken a church van, I don't remember riding in it. I must have ridden in one of the counselor's cars. We'd been in this location about two years before on a different retreat with no bad incidents, so I don't think my premonitory fear had anything to do with the location itself. However, since the location was on the Appalachian Trail, well, anything's possible. This area of the US has had plenty of evil things happen within its territory, so I would imagine that anything was possible. Everything from ghosts to bad karma from the atrocities of slavery to missing 411 cases, you name it, it's happened here. I've researched the area where that campsite is located. It's part of a state park, and I've searched online reviews to see if anyone else has had any paranormal experiences there. All the reviews I see are good ones with only minor complaints such as the neighboring campsite had a dog that barked all night, or that the kitty playground wasn't very fun. Nothing referring to cold spots, missing people, ghosts, or anything of the sort. If someone has had a really scary experience at this particular place, I've yet to find it, and I've studied it in depth. Anyway, I don't remember arriving, unpacking, or even what we did most of the time, but I do know we stopped at a flea market on the way. I remember walking through the aisles, admiring a doll that was way too expensive for me to buy, and I remember filming some scenery and some of us clowning around, although the film did not turn out well and was sort of faded. I still have it to this day and can remember some of what I filmed. Vicky is nowhere to be seen in the film. That's why I think she didn't arrive until that night or the second night we were there. At some point, we girls gathered in some sort of arts and crafts building to make some small floral arrangements. I don't know why we did this, unless there's something in the Bible about lavender, because that's what they were made of. They were like little dried flower posies made of lavender. To this day, I cannot stand the smell of lavender, real or fake. It's like garlic to a vampire with me. I'll explain why later. The next thing I remember is being gathered around a bonfire, but we weren't close to our cabins. We were instead out in a field, with the fire glowing, and there was some sort of half-barn amphitheater thing off to the side. It looked like something put up for local bands, or it could have been used for a church group gathering. At the time, it was pitch black dark out, except for the firelight and some small outdoor lights on the stage area. And of course, who should be sitting up on the stage, ready to grace us with a song? You guessed right. There sat Vicky, with an 80s boombox and an accompaniment tape, ready to belt out another high soprano number. Another strange thing is that I don't remember her hiking with us up to this place, so she must have drove down there in her car. We could do little but sit still and awkwardly listen to the song, out in the middle of nowhere. Now here is a very strange thing that I didn't remember until years later. Think about this. We were sitting either on the ground or on benches in August, right? I don't remember getting a single bug bite of any kind. We were out there at least an hour or two, because after Vicky's solo was over, I'm sure the youth pastor gave some sort of message or devotional reading or something. I remember we roasted hot dogs and marshmallows. I do seem to remember that, but not one mosquito bite. The next thing I remember is lying in one of the bunks in the cabin. I don't remember putting on one of the long night shirts I always slept in, so I may have just slept in my clothes, and I don't remember taking a shower although there was a bathroom in the cabin, so we didn't have to go to a bathhouse or anything. I was kind of a clean freak, especially when I was in any kind of camping situation, so I'm sure I probably did take a shower, but I honestly don't remember doing it. Anyway, the cabin was divided into two rooms, with the bathroom between them. On the previous retreat, I'd stayed in the back room, where there were stacked bunk beds. This time, however, I got stuck in the front room with a single bunk against the wall. I say I got stuck, because guess who decided to spend the night instead of driving back? Yep, Vicky. I wasn't thrilled about this, and I was even getting concerned, but could do nothing about it. The rest of the girls had all the back bunks claimed. Except for two or three girls, the rest of the group was younger than I 
and looking back, I don't remember how I got stuck with the younger set. Not that I didn't like them, but I felt frankly too old to be on this trip. I was outgrowing the youth group. To give you an idea of my bunk's position, if I got off the bunk to my right, the front door of the cabin was about 11 or 12 feet in front of me. There was a small high window to the right of the front door, high enough so that no one passing by could look inside. It was glass and had no screen. Keep this in mind for later as well. The rest of the bunks were also to my right. There were about five or six other girls and two counselors, one of which was Vicky. The third counselor was in the back room with the rest. I could do nothing except get through this night and dream of being 18 the next year, when my parents would no longer be able to force me to do anything or go anywhere I didn't want to. But for now, what could I do? Where could I go? I knew I wanted to leave, but I was over 100 miles from home, and there were no cell phones then, so I couldn't just call my parents to come pick me up. And I couldn't get one of the other counselors with the guys to drive me all the way home in the middle of the night, so I was absolutely stuck. The bunks weren't all crowded together like what you see in a makeshift disaster shelter, but the room was not very large either, so we were all still close together. I'd say I was probably 10 feet from Vicky's bunk. She was to my right, toward the front door in the middle of the room. She wasn't blocking the door in any way, but if I had decided to leave, I would have had to walk past her. My bunk had a very worn out mattress and I remember saying that I felt like a hot dog because the sides folded up around me like a bun. That sounds funny, I know, but later that night, I was glad that it did. It helped to hide me. In addition to not getting any bug bites, I will mention two more strange things before I try to describe what happened next. As I said, this was in the middle of August in the Mid-South in a cabin with no air conditioning. At no time do I remember feeling hot, and I'm sure it was hot and humid, because we had been hot and sweating while I'd been filming earlier in the day. So I was lying there in a bunk with some kind of clothing on with a mattress folded up around me in August and I was not hot. This wasn't normal. The second abnormal thing was that not only did I not have any bug bites, I didn't hear any bugs either. This is worth noting because at that time of year, the noise from cicadas or cicadas and katydids is deafening. Even as I finally drifted off to sleep in that cheap mattress, I don't remember any sounds from outside. No deer walking around, no sound from the boys' cabin, no bugs, no distant traffic or planes flying overhead, no coyotes, no owls, no crickets, nothing. I know that total silence in the woods setting is abnormal and usually means something's wrong. If I were in the same situation today, I would have gotten up, walked to the campsite office, and called myself a cab. But as I said, I was young, innocent, naive, and thought, oh so wrongly, that I was safe. I was deeply asleep when I heard the crashing of shattering glass. Then there was a long, piercing scream. My eyes snapped open, and immediately I looked at the high glass window, thinking in nanoseconds, I can't believe one of the boys would throw a rock through our window. They were all good kids. Vandalism just wasn't something they would have done, not even to prank us. My brain was trying to wake up completely, and after about two more seconds, I was wide awake but I didn't move. Something was telling me, don't move. What I heard then was this. Did you hear that demon fly out of my mouth? I raised my face just barely over the edge of my folded up mattress, and I saw Vicky shrieking this and rocking back and forth. The other counselor sprang up and started to try to console and shush her. She had a flashlight and her Bible opened, starting to read scriptures to her. I couldn't tell if Vicky was crying or just mumbling incoherently. Again, I looked up at the window. It wasn't broken, so where had the crashing of glass sound come from? I lay completely still, although every cell in my body was screaming at me to run out the front door and just keep running. It had finally happened. This woman had gone off the deep end. It was around 3.30 a.m., I think, and here is another phenomenal thing. None of the girls woke up and asked what was going on. They continued to sleep as though they'd been drugged. No one stirred. No one moved. I thought that maybe, like me, they were just too afraid to move. But some of them were snoring. I could hear it. From the front room and from the back of the cabin. 
I was in survival mode at this point. I lay as still as the dead. Let me also make this clear, that I did not have sleep paralysis. I was wide awake. I could move. But as I said, something inside my head was telling me to freeze. Chalk it up to an angel or my second sight or whatever label you want to put on it. But I was wide awake and staring. At one point, the other counselor looked around in the dark with a flashlight, perhaps to see if any of us had awakened. And when I saw the beam moving over towards me, I snapped my eyes shut. I would play dead if I had to. I listened to the counselor praying, and I remember wanting to jump out of that bunk and run so badly. I was young and lean then, and they most likely couldn't have caught up to me. But I didn't breathe, I didn't pray, and I didn't move. I was being told not to move, and I did as I was told. After about ten minutes, the other counselor got up and ran to the bathroom. I don't know if she was throwing up or if it literally scared the crap out of her, but she stayed in there for a while, with the door pretty much open, which left me alone with a crazy woman and a room full of slumbering adolescents. With great difficulty, I raised my head only slightly, enough to keep my eye on Vicky. If she got off that bunk, that was it. I would run to the back room and slam the door and barricade myself in with the girls in the back. She was still rocking, with her back to me, facing the front of the cabin. She was still muttering to herself. Or at least I think so. I couldn't understand anything she was saying. Maybe it was another language, or knowing her, she probably thought she was speaking in tongues. Then, this woman turned her head around to look over her shoulder looking in my direction. It really was as if whatever had taken over her knew that I was awake, because she didn't turn to look at anyone else. My head was only barely elevated, but I saw her face lit from below by the flashlight, which makes even normal people look creepy. So we have to factor that in here, but what little I did see I never wanted to see again. What I saw was nothing like the silly CGI stuff or demonic makeup in Halloween stores. The problem is, I can't really describe what I saw, but I'll try. Her eyes were dark, but not like those black-eyed kids or something like that, just dark, as if the eyes themselves had sunk into the sockets. The face looked both angry, scared, sad, all of that all at once. She looked right at me, straight into my eyes for only a second because I snapped my eyes shut again to block her, or it, out. Also, her hair covered part of her face, so I didn't get a clear look, thank goodness. If this woman was doing all of this as a prank, which I seriously considered over the years, then she could have earned an Oscar for her performance. But a prank could not explain the window shattering while somehow remaining unbroken, and it could not explain her sudden bass baritone voice. What she said to me when she looked at me, I don't know. I don't ever want to know. It was some incomprehensible language. Or it may have been gibberish. I only saw her mouth move for a second as she spoke behind some strands of hair. Sort as give us it. Sort as give us it. I fully expected this insane woman to get out of bed and come after me. But she simply turned around and continued muttering in that low bass voice. The high soprano voice was gone. After a few more minutes, the other counselor came back and Vicky asked her in her now normal voice, Are you okay? Whether the other counselor heard the low bass voice from the bathroom or not, I'll never know. I swear on my life, everything I've just written is true. It's possible for sopranos to lower their voices, sure. In Mongolia, it's known as throat singing. So maybe this woman had some voice training? Maybe that's what she did. It may have been that she was just a mentally ill individual, and that this was a desperate plea for attention. Maybe she was trying to give us some twisted spiritual lesson on demons. But that does not explain the window. It still haunts me to this day. I do remember looking around the floor in the morning for broken glass, for pieces of the window. When I couldn't find any, I thought that maybe she had broken a glass of water when she shot up from the bed shrieking. Oh, and that shriek, I can still hear it, as if it just happened. It never goes away, and I guess it never will. And the silence, no girls stirring or coming in from the back room to ask what was going on, no animal noises or cicadas singing in the trees. 
I should have been wringing wet with sweat, either from the August heat or a cold sweat from pure terror. Anyway, after all this, Vicky and the counselor collapsed onto their bunks from sheer exhaustion. But I lay awake from about 3.45 to 4 a.m. until dawn. All around the room hung those dried lavender flowers, whose fragrance had now become a sickening, overpowering stench that made me nauseous. They had not bothered me in the slightest until now, as I lie there waiting for an eternity to pass before the dimmest hope of light began to show through the unbroken window. Still, not one of the girls moved, not even to get up to go to the bathroom. The only sound was slight snoring, and even that was muffled. I never took my eyes off Vicky even though she was completely asleep, completely still. I did not move. In the years since this happened, I've pulled all-nighters to study in college and worked overnights in a department store, so I know what it is to be tired from staying awake all night. But none of that can possibly compare to the exhaustion I felt that next morning. I think I pretended to be asleep until most everyone had gone out for breakfast. I don't remember seeing Vicky outside around the picnic tables when we had our Bible study before we left. I don't remember eating either, nor talking to anyone. I found my younger brother and asked which car he was riding back in. Everyone else had claimed their rides, I guess, and no one seemed to want to ride with Edward, the older gentleman in his 70s, who had come out on the trip to cook for us. He had volunteered to help with the guys and brought his old Sanford and Son type truck, with no air conditioning. My brother said he was going to ride with him, so I climbed in next to him. We left the premises, and I never looked back, and I've never gone back to that place. We got out on the two-lane road to get to the highway, and somewhere down the road, maybe five or six miles, the sun came out shining bright. Then and only then did I start to feel hot and start to sweat. Normally, I'm an air conditioning addict, but for once, it felt good to feel this heat, because the heat felt normal. I was back with two normal people in an old rattle-trap truck, headed home. Edward was a quiet, soft-spoken man, and we rode with him all the way back home listening to his calm, soothing voice as he talked about this and that. I was glad we had chosen him to get us home. Surprisingly, my life went back to normal after that. Within the next couple of weeks, I started school and was glad to be around normal people in a normal classroom. Somehow that dried lavender had come home with me and I don't understand how that happened because I never packed it, but you can bet I threw it out. If my brother had caught wind of any of these events, he never did speak about it. As far as I know, neither did any of the other guys. None of the girls seemed to know about it either. They'd all slept through it. We've talked about that retreat in years since, and they've never acted like they knew anything unusual happened, so I kept my mouth shut. I don't know if what happened at that place had to do with the location itself, out in the Appalachian Trail, or if it was brought in by this crazy church woman. The atmosphere seemed normal until she joined our group that evening, even though I'd felt uneasy about going on the trip at first, I must have been distracted enough by my filmmaking on that first day, because the sense of foreboding was temporarily alleviated. The anxious feeling returned when we arrived at that bonfire, right before she arrived. In time, Vicky seemed to just fade away from that church, going off to act crazy in someone else's unfortunate house of worship. After the incident, I went to church less and less, I got into some heated arguments with my mother over it. It's not like I had a problem with the faith itself, it was just fear of certain people. But I couldn't explain this to her. By the next year, I was legally an adult, and there wasn't much she could do to force me to go. Whenever I would give in and go, I would show up late, barely heard the sermon, and I would duck out as soon as the preacher would start the closing prayer. I just couldn't be around those people anymore. Even though Vicky had gone, there were still some other weird church people to avoid, so I did. I buried what had happened and never talked about it, but I've always had one burning question. Why was I the only one of the youth group to be awakened? Why me? That scares me more than anything else, and I don't know that I want an answer to that question at all. The only time I saw Vicky after she had left the church was about three years later in a small grocery store. I ran into an old friend of mine from high school and we were standing there in the checkout line when the front door slid open and in walked Vicky talking with someone. She didn't see me, fortunately. 
In an instant, I ducked down behind the magazine and candy stands, and my friend thought I was having a fainting spell or something. She wasn't too far off the mark. I suddenly felt queasy and dizzy-headed. I looked up and asked her, Where's that woman that just came in? She told me she'd walk to the far back of the store, so I got up quickly and did the fastest checkout of my life. The cashier knew something was wrong and hurriedly scanned everything for me. My friend helped me bag my items, and when we got outside I told her that I had a horrible experience with that woman on a church retreat, and I had to get out of here before she came back. She understood, and we exchanged phone numbers to stay in touch. After that I jumped into my car and sped off. From then on I absolutely avoided that part of town, and I still do today, just in case. It's possible that Vicky may be dead now. She was in her late 40s or 50s back then, but who knows. My only advice to anyone in church is this. Just because a person goes to church doesn't automatically make them sane or trustworthy. If you're a parent, check out the people going along as counselors on your child's church camp trips. If they claim to be Christian or whatever faith you follow, that doesn't really mean anything. Maybe it mattered in the old days and carried more weight then, but not anymore. And if your child is feeling uneasy about something, anything, don't just brush it off. Children, even in adolescence, are sometimes more in tune with the ability to sense when someone or something is just wrong. And while I personally do not play around with Ouija boards, witchcraft, or calling up spirits, the evil that these crazy, supposedly more spiritually gifted women see is, in reality, not to be found in your latest heavy metal rock album, or action figure, or role-playing game. Sometimes that evil is sitting or standing right next to you in church, and it may want a hug. That brings us to the end of this episode of Darkness Prevails. More terrifying stories are on the way soon, so subscribe and smash that like button. By the way, did you know this show is available as a podcast called Unexplained Encounters? Just search for, follow, and rate Unexplained Encounters on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. This show is part of the EerieCast network. Go to EerieCast.com for more scary podcasts, such as Freaky Folklore, which explores your favorite monsters, myths, and mysteries, as well as Redwood Bureau, a fictional horror podcast about an agent on the run from an evil secret organization that captures supernatural creatures and entities. Well, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one. <laughs>